So good morning once again. So as you know, Dr. Samir Sastrabuddha is going to engage with you for several sessions uh, from uh, next session onwards, uh, talking to you about visual communication, particularly about the skills in setting up your graphics and also how to organize your concepts so that you can present them properly. But because the main theme of this entire course is improving our ability to articulate ourselves properly while composing technical literature, if you recall, we have taken a single task for the entire course as the most important task, and that is to prepare a report, technical report on your own. And again, to reiterate, this report will primarily be based on your own interests in research pertaining to the seminars that you have registered. Preparing a seminar report of the best quality and presenting it to the best of your abilities is the target of this course. Now, to begin with, any research begins with understanding how other people have looked at the problem that you are trying to solve and that is mostly done through a process called literature survey. All of you are familiar with literature survey. So anybody who has conducted a literature survey earlier before coming to IIT, how come when I said are you familiar with literature survey, everybody sort of nodded. But when I said have you conducted a literature survey ever, only one hand partially was raised. So what is it? Let us speak loudly. Have you conducted a literature survey earlier before coming to IIT? One yes and few yes. All right. Have you heard the term literature survey? Can you guess what literature survey could mean? Surveying an existing topic from what point? Because a topic has multiple facets. So surveying a topic from the point of view of technical literature that has been written to solve problems associated with that topic. You don't read technical literature as a storybook. You read it to enhance your own knowledge and understanding of what other people have done about that topic. So once you define a problem, you have to actually describe some aspects of that problem to yourself. What are you going to solve? What problem are you solving? And then you start searching for literature or papers presented typically in conferences or journals to find out which of those papers, and there are millions of papers for various topics, which of those papers pertain to A, the topic that you are working on, the problem that you are solving, and subsequently, having collected 50, 60, 100 such references, you then say, all right, out of these 100 references, which seem to be generically indicating some work related to this problem, the specific problem that I am interested in is perhaps dealt with by only these five or seven papers. And then you read those five or seven papers more carefully and present your finding and understanding in the form of a report. That is essentially a literature survey. So you survey the available literature. Please note that you might miss out on some important contribution made somewhere just because you have not searched well enough. So the first task in the literature survey is to search the world globally. In old days, traditionally, the only access to information was through journals and conference proceedings. I remember in my MTech time as well as in subsequently PhD time, we used to go to library and jot down relevant references. Anytime a new journal uh, issue comes in or a new proceedings come in, you'll go there IEEE or Computer Society, whatever, whatever, ACM, and you'll scan through them, ah, this is one paper which could be useful, that is one paper which could be useful. How do you organize that information? Do you just remember in IEEE volume published in last February 2015, I saw that paper. For two days you may remember that. Two days later, I saw some paper. Ten days later, I think I saw something. Don't remember. So do you write down? Forget the literature survey. Whenever you read a book or whenever you listen to a lecture, do you take notes? You do. Note taking itself is an art, by the way. It's an art of communication. So listening to a lecture and taking notes is an important point. I believe that is being covered or has been covered in the institute course. But coming back to our literature survey, one of the problems that is 
constantly faced by all our MTech and PhD students is that whenever they submit a project report, whether it is a MTP or seminar report or first stage of annual uh, PhD research, uh, whatever, whatever, they will invariably have a list of references. Everybody has read at least one research paper in life or not yet. Anybody who has not read any research paper from any journal or conference? Oh, not a single brave heart. Anyway, so all of you are familiar with the way the papers are written, right? At the end of each paper, you will find citations, uh, uh, references, which are cited in the text. You are familiar with that also? How is a reference written? So in a seminar report or an MTP or in a PID thesis or a progress report, invariably at the end of the report you will have references. How are you expected to write them? There is a standardization. Forget the rest of the world. Department of Computer Science and Engineering issues a standardization. How many of you are familiar with that standard? None of you. So that means you go to the department wiki just to see a particular notice relevant to you, saying tomorrow is a holiday or some such thing. Please explore the departmental wiki. Please explore the material that is available in your own department, on your own department website, and find out how the references are written. Why I'm emphasizing this point is that people in their list of references typically will write the names of the authors, often a single name, initials missing. They will write the title, which will always be approximately accurate, not exact. They will occasionally write the journal in which it was published or the conference in which it was presented. They will invariably forget to give the reference of the year in which it was published, the volume in which it was published, the page numbers in which it was published, and if there is an ISBN number. Are you familiar with ISBN numbers associated with books and proceedings? You, do you really go to physical library ever or don't? You do. So you know ISBN. So can you explain what is ISBN? So what she is saying is that every book is assigned a unique number. It is not an arbitrary sequential number. It's actually a coded number. But those of you who do not know about it should find out what is ISBN, what is that ISBN number and so on. Please note that the method and the discipline of writing percolates to proper organization of information as well. And book is probably the most organized form of presentation. We'll talk more about book writing and book reading. But the second problem is, even if your reference is correct, you will invariably rush to library or rush to your resource at the end of writing your report saying, Are, what is the exact reference? Because in the first instance, when you visited that paper, you forgot to jot down the important things. Now, I'll tell you the discipline that we were taught when there were no computers. We were all used to be given index cards, small postcard size thing with the lines. And our gurus will tell us that when you go to the library, you see a good paper, you glance through it all right, but the minimum information that you must jot down on this index card is the title of the paper, the journal or conference in which it appeared, the names of the authors, and the abstract. Why? Because abstract is supposed to give you the gist of that paper. When you first time look at it, you don't even know whether that paper is going to be useful to you or not. You don't know. So you write down the abstract topic. Today, when you get access to such papers on net, you invariably will search through, glance on the screen and forget about it. You might jot down just the name of the author or something like that. And that is the beginning of a huge nuisance for you. Because you will end up spending time later in compiling the same information again and again. And if you don't, you will get at least one downgrade in your grade because your references are not properly written. You will get another downgrade in your grade because the reference that you are citing in your text and the sentences accompanying that citation 
do not indicate any connection with what was discussed in that paper because you have forgot so first principle whenever you look at a paper you must actually prepare a growing document like this so for example roll number 051013 deepak patak topic teaching and learning programming that's a problem i am looking at so for teaching and learning programming i write list of references and abstracts this is a soft copy i am preparing i have not written a single line here except the top my name etc all others are extracted from the search that i made on the web but notice the way i have jotted it down first sc latin and christi almukta hanumati jervinen these are the authors a study of the difficulties of novice programmers proceedings of itic 05 proceedings of the 10th annual 6 csc conference of innovation and technology in computer science education pages 14 to 18 acm new york ny usa copyright 2005 isbn this many of you might be seeing all these details carefully for the first time but these are the minimum details that must be there in every reference that you cite anywhere if you don't do that it's not a question of losing grade you will be considered sloppy if a paper that you present which contains your brilliant technical work and if that paper is presented with such sloppy references people will simply ignore that right up if you want to make an impact you have to be perfect and this is the perfection first step in. so is that clear that means when you start the literature survey you will be scanning as i said 50 70 100 30 papers across the globe you know how to search papers how do you search the literature digital one way of course traditionally go to library and look at the references but how do you search them google search and google scholar google scholar those of you who do not know this please write down the name google scholar and google search google search of course everybody knows in fact there is a verb called google the great which means search the name but google scholar will give you a lot of them and there are digital assets our library subscribes to a large number of online journals and conference proceeding i do not know whether you are aware of the, that or not but for your own sake please find out which are the journals which are the conferences for which iit bombay library digitally subscribes to find out how do you get an authenticated user id for use it's a shared usage but you can find out this now what is most important is when you search something whether it's a physical journal in which case you methodically type down the name abstract and all these details if it's a digital journal you extract that information like so this is just a sample sheet i have put up on the net by the way that reminds me how many of you actually read the two documents which i had sent a mail to you to read before coming to the class one very sporadic you are making a mockery of the flip classroom the whole concept hinges on the fact that people will actually study some basic material at home so that we can have more lively discussion session from the blank looks on your faces i could figure out that most of you have not read this please don't do that next time proceedings whatever is the proceedings or the reference paper you see pages 32 to 36 are pages of that publication for which the isbn number is given or for which uh, the acm cgc bulletin archive volume 39 so this is actually a reference matter means there exists some printed copy somewhere guarantee but brings me to another question you might find several references which are actually give a very detailed account of the, uh, the uh, some solution for your problem but they are not published in a proceedings or some this is a web paper so how would you refer to that any idea yeah sorry url and access date url so that other people can refer to url why is access date important content might change you see that's a fundamental difference between a printed material and a web material a printed material does not change a new edition may subsequently come but once printed it remains permanent uh, imprint 
if I have a web page in which I publish a good paper today, and then I suddenly say, oh, I have actually written something wrong. It's my web page, so I change it. Now you go and cite that reference with the original writing, and the person who is examining you say, but this is not what Fatak said. You say, no, no, sir, this is what Fatak said. Now the teacher goes and looks at the Fatak's page, finds out it's completely different than what you have done. So the excess date is important, but is it adequate? Supposing he says, no, 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 I have excess Fatak website in December 2015. Now the, my examiner or your examiner will say, how do I know that this was the content in 2015? Because what I see is this. Let us go ask Fatak what was the published material. Can you do that? No. Therefore, every paper that you cite from the web, not only you must give access on, but you must download that paper and keep it with you as a soft asset. Must. No choice. If you don't do that, you may even fail a course. You may fail a seminar for wrongly representing, for no fault of yours. Am I adequately being emphatic? No choice in that. Either you give a proper reference to a printed or a published thing. If it's a web page, not only say accessed on this date, but also download that copy and keep it with a file name of your choice. But the date on which the file was created must have the date on which you claim you have downloaded. You can't say accessed on this date and two months later download it. Then there is a mismatch between your citation and the file creation. So these are fortunate. Of course, people can do fancy stuff by changing the date and time of the computer and then creating something, etc., etc. But we believe we are all honest and decent people. We won't do that. All right. So this is the first task. This list would be a growing list. And this initial survey, which is almost a random head, random search, all that you are looking for certain keywords which pertain to your problem area. And it is not uncommon to create the first list of 50, 60 references. By the way, it would take roughly two days and two nights of searching to just get the first cut list of 50 or 60. Now, do you read all 60 papers seriously? No, you can't, unless you are doing a, a very detailed survey kind of paper itself. But you would generally glance through those papers. So how do you read a research paper? Now, some of you have read the paper which I had put up on the web. Not very many, some. So how much time did you spend on reading that paper? It was a eight or nine page paper. 30 minutes, that's a very long time. Anybody else who has read that? So I listened to Professor Sahanamurti telling us on how to read a research paper. That's an art, by the way. Since most of you are silent, and you have no clue on how to properly read a research paper, I think it is worthwhile to look at what she says. The session on how to read a research paper. By now you might have uh, undergone several sessions in which you may have heard of the scientific process, the various... I will be uploading this and another lecture by her. It's unfortunately a full one hour lecture. So you might have to listen to both these lectures in succession. I'll be putting a, uh, putting both these on the web so you can download and watch yourself. But I'll be playing some parts of these contents because they are extremely relevant, particularly of the stages in which you ought to read any one research paper. The point is, if you spend, say, 35 40 minutes, which is a good thing that you did, but imagine this. You have collected a list of 100 papers. Now, each paper you spend 40 to 50 minutes to understand that paper completely. And then realize that this paper does not add any value to the problem that you are solving. You have wasted 50 minutes of your time with some useless knowledge added to your memory. You can't afford to do that with 100 papers. 40 into 100 minutes. How much is that? 4,000 minutes. How many hours? And you have other nice and interesting things to do in life than literature. Sir. You can afford to do that. You can, you can afford to do that for five or six papers. But which five? So <coughs> that is how you do the staging. Let us look at this. She is Professor Sahanamurti, by the way, a faculty member in our internship program on educational technology. Uh, she works very closely with Professor Sridhar Iyer of her department and have done some extraordinary research and finding which has helped us propagate across the country the use of flipped classroom and active learning. 
parts of the research process, the scientific method, the skills required while doing engineering or science background, I agree. But the kind of guidelines we are talking about are not specific to any one discipline. They are mostly reasonable. Just to give you the context, there was a workshop that we conducted when we trained 10,000 teachers across the country for the first time. The title of the workshop was Research Methodology. And this was coordinated by Professor Karmalakar of IIT Madras, whom we had specially called in, uh, Professor Sachin from uh, uh, Chemical Engineering, a lot of people. Sunoj was there, several people, very good people. In that, as a part of that workshop, we were trying to tell the participating teachers. Because, you see, our teachers in most of the institutions come from our own ilk. Several of them have not even done their MTA. Very few have done PhD. So they have not been initiated into research. And therefore, this was organized. And that is the reason why it appears generic. It does not say computer science because the, uh, the lecture was not intended for computer scientists alone, but an important. So these are the guidelines that she's going to talk about. to computer science, electrical engineering, can supposed to read as a pre-homework for this session. It's called Design and Deployment of Clickers in Distance Education. I'm assuming that you have read it because a lot of examples that we will be doing today are based on that paper. And uh, it would be good if you have a printout of the paper. No, I didn't bring a printout because I presumed that you would have read that paper. But given that only two or three people or four people have read that paper, this whole exercise will flow tangentially to your head. I will still do it very quickly. But please understand that when you, re when you view this lecture, either keep a printout on your hand or keep that paper open in another window. And in one window, you play this video. Then you will be able to understand and correlate. But let me just tell you the basic for steps. In front of you, maybe one for every page, is to get the big picture on that paper. And uh, it would be good if you have a printout of the paper in front of you, maybe one for every two or three participants. And if you don't, perhaps the coordinators can help at this point. When she says coordinators, whom is she referring to? Any idea? Remember, she is talking to 10,000 teachers across the country. These 10,000 teachers don't assemble at a single place. The mechanism that I have set up is we have more than 300 remote centers. In this particular workshop, about 200 of them participated. At each remote center, 30, 40 teachers would assemble. And those 30, 40 teachers, participating teachers, their activities will be coordinated by one workshop coordinator. So she is referring to a coordinator. So like we have a classroom here, and let's say Sahana Murthy is speaking from IIT Kharagpur. So I will be your coordinator asking you to do the same thing. This is almost a kind of a group discussion or a team discussion uh, uh, facilitated by a coordinator. But look at the three plus stage approach for reading a research paper. Please read this carefully. I will quickly play the portion that she talks about. Stage zero, get a feel. Stage one, get the big picture. Stage two, get the details. Stage three, evaluate the details. And you reach stage three plus only if you are convinced that that paper is actually relevant to what you are doing. But anyway, let's quickly go through this process so that you understand. Okay, so let's actually look at the process of, or the approach of how to read a research paper. And we've called it the three plus stage approach here. Now, there's a lot of references and a lot of people have given good advice on how to read a research paper. So what we'll talk about today is really a, it's been borrowed from some things that people have already said. I'll tell you sometime later, uh, towards the end of this talk, on where to find some of these good references. And most of them talk about the approach to reading a research paper in a process which looks like what you see on this on the slide here. The zero at stage, so this is really before you actually begin the first stage, is what I call get a feel for the paper. And each of these boxes, we're going to expand in the next few minutes. Feel is something very quick. It's literally a feel. You may just pick up a paper like this, and you may flip through it. First important stage 
is to get the big picture. Then one gets the details from the paper, one evaluates the details and to get a good idea of the paper one has to at least go through stage 3. And if you are a research student or a researcher who is uh, using the paper for your current work, you often have to go to stage 3 plus where you have to synthesize the details. Okay, so let's get a look at what we mean by get a feel for the paper and how to do it. Uh, by the way, each stage will require one reading of the paper. So when you read a research paper, it's a multi, uh, or multi you have, you'll have to read it multiple times. In fact, that's one of the questions we explore later. So how do you get a feel? First thing is read the simplest thing, the largest thing on the paper and the largest font is usually the title. So read the title. Ponder upon it if you'd like for a few seconds. And then as I mentioned earlier, pick up the paper and see how long it is. And papers vary in length a lot. Typical, and the, the variation is really huge. It can be as small as four papers and sometimes you see reflection papers as small as two, pa two pages. And sometimes they might go to 30 or 40 pages. So well, you, you need to get an idea of how large the paper is. And typically, the length of the paper also is, uh, it depends on the type or where it's been published. For example, uh, conference papers for technical research conferences are usually between four and eight pages. Journal articles are longer and these can be small like five or six pages, it can actually even be four, but it can go up to 15 or 20 pages, typically. Review or survey papers are usually much longer. If you can get a review or survey paper on your topic, then that's a gold mine. Because somebody has done exactly what you are attempting to do, a literature survey. But the entire paper is only about literature. So I am not going to add any new value, but I am for the benefit of all co-researchers in the world, I am actually compiling information about 50, 100 research papers. Each one of them is methodically studied to stage 3 plus and then consolidate. I am just presenting to you on a platter what you would take months to research or search, right? We are not fortunate to get this because uh, it, it is unfortunately not considered the most important contribution that a researcher can make and therefore very few researchers venture into writing such papers. Only when you have made a name for yourself and you are established as a dada in the field, then you can afford the luxury of doing such survey papers, etc., but not till. Okay, the next thing you need to know when uh, you're just getting a feel for the paper is uh, where is this paper published? The bibliographic details, as we call it. And one needs to know how to find this information and where to find this information. So, bibliographic details. Where was the paper published? Remember what I said? page number, proceedings, year, all of you invariably treat this information as dirt, useless. And all of you suffer the consequences. I have seen uh, seminar presentations after seminar presentations where the examiner's team is berating the student not for lack of talent reflect, reflected in the work, but because of the useless manner in which the references have been compiled. And in fact, every examiner these days first looks at your introduction, abstract, conclusion and reference. And if the references are sloppily written, the examiner mentally decides to give you a, either a fail grade or just a pass grade, independent of the nature of your work. That is the importance of organizing. So I cannot overstate that case. And in spite of my stating this every year, Again and again I find that the references which are compiled and presented in your research papers are very shoddily written. Please don't ever do that. Uh, typically what happens is it's available, if you've downloaded the paper from the journal website or if you've photocopied it from a specific journal, you should look at the header or the footer of the page and you will find that information. If you have downloaded it from a website, from let's say somebody's personal page, see if they give bibliographic details. And what we mean by these details are the year, the title, the journal, where it's been published and so on. So before reading the research paper in details, 
if you follow my style of compiling the base material, you would have automatically done this. So getting the feel for a paper is what you will actually do for every paper that you do for hundreds of papers before going through the details of any paper. That is the suggested approach. And the feel you get not only by flipping through the pages and reading it, but even on a web, you do exactly. But what I am adding is, while you do that, independent of whether that paper is going to be useful to you or not, please extract this material. You will just have to copy paste on a document and keep it. It doesn't take too long. You might be helping yourself, most important. If not, you might be helping others. Because what you are creating is actually some kind of a collection of survey of papers. At least the names and titles and abstracts. Look at the figures. Just glance at them, see if, see what you think. And read the headings. So when we say get a feel for the paper, this is all you do. So look at the figures. Just like a storybook. Graphs. Figures. What do they make some sense? And read the section and subsection headings. If you read the section and subsection headings along with the title, you will get a feel for that paper. Do you agree? It's common sense, right? But we don't apply. Typically, we start reading a paper completely. We should not do that, actually. And this can take as little as one minute sometimes. We'll come to uh, how long should I spend on a research paper. We'll come to this question a little later. But this is really getting a quick feel. In fact, you'd be able to get a feel of this of a paper much quicker than it took me to go through this slide. Okay, so one thing that we will have to look at before we go on to getting the details of a paper is that the scientific research paper is actually a very peculiar art piece of writing. It's not a story, but it's not a, a story. Let me digress here a bit and tell you about something else which is, which is very relevant. If you look at what she has written, it's highly structured, almost predictable headings. Every item in paper exists for a reason, nothing merely for cosmetic reason. That is the difference between a story and a, a research paper. And each part connected with other parts, sentence, section one, sequence is important, and figure and text correlate. All this makes sense. In fact, books are written like that, chapters, etc. Now, I pose a completely different problem related to how human beings understand world and anything in the world and how human beings make a model in their mind of whatever knowledge they have learned. Anybody has read about this? Okay. How many of you are familiar with the term Concept maps. Anybody who has heard this? No. It's a new wine in the old bottle. It actually represents the way most human beings think and learn. So let us go back in time to our childhood. When we are growing up, we are not learning research or anything. We are not even going to school. But we are learning about the world. What are the typical things that we learn when, let's say, we are admitted to kindergarten or first standard or something like that, just starting to go to school? First, we learn a language. Through the language, we try to identify things, okay, fixing the nomenclature in our mind and associated with that nomenclature in number of other facets which come to us. So as a child, what will I say? I'll say mother is a concept. Father is another concept. Sibling could be third concept. Food is another concept. Okay. Now, as a child, when you think of food, what do you associate the food with? Father, sibling, always mother. Okay. Fight.
When you grow up, you start fighting with your father and mother, but that is much later. You will find that there are umpteen such things and there are cross-correlated. You suddenly discover that while your mother takes care of food, father takes care of your study, but if you misbehave, both join hands together and bash you. So there is a relationship between. This is how we build. This is called a concept map. Now, without going into further details, you can easily imagine that it is natural. Human brain is nothing but a neural net. And therefore, it is natural that it should be repressed. We have no way of figuring out how the brain does it. As somebody said, brain mapping, you cannot measure the neurons flowing through the connections to figure out how the brain thinks. That's a different thing altogether. But the fact of life is that the brain maps these concepts and the network in their mind. That is how we all learn. All of us will always have concepts and relations. Why I am saying this is, now look at not just the research paper, but any book or any write-up that you do. Any write-up is essentially sequential, right? So you have paragraph, 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 paragraph. You at the most have chapter, chapter, paragraph, paragraph, paragraph. Of course, when you want to represent, let us say, multiple things related to a topic, you may have separate sections. These sections must appear sequentially because that is the nature of any writing, any script is sequential. However, you may be able to represent the interrelationship between concepts such by saying that this is chapter, this is section one, this is section two, but section three may be related to section two. If they are not necessarily independent sections. They may be sequence also. Within section, there will be paragraph. In short, <coughs> any writing that is done is essentially sequential and at best it can represent a tree. Agreed? At best, it can represent a tree. There is no way some section here can refer to this. In fact, it is done which is called cross-referencing. But in a printed text, when you go to page 56 and he says, look up page 25. You have to physically go to 25 page. And then where on page 25? Third line, fifth line, you'll get confused. Please understand, therefore, the importance, criticality and difficulty of both writing a book or a paper and reading and understanding. If I am writing a paper, I am actually trying to represent this concept map into a sequential structure. When you are reading a paper, you are trying to recreate a concept map in your own mind. I hope that that concept map is similar to this concept map which I have in mind. Will I always succeed? Not necessarily. That is the reason why writing a good book is extremely difficult and only recently books have started coming with a concept map of the book. You may think concept map is very difficult to draw. Uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Sastrabhuddha is going to actually discuss this, he calls it affinity maps and so on later on. But here is a concrete story, umpteen cases, umpteen examples where children were told a story and they were asked to prepare a concept map. Children who can't even write properly. But you will be amazed to know that most children came up with almost a similar concept maps. That is because when they heard a story which was interesting to them, they could correlate to their own mental image of the world and could say, ah, this, this, this relates to this. They might write poor English, poor Hindi, whatever, but they could do that. Have we lost the ability to do that? We don't know. We have never tested it. None of you would have ever drawn concept map for anything. So I stop this digression here. 
but it is extremely important that you understand the notion that the model of the knowledge in your mind whether it is a research topic or problem solving whatever whatever is always in the form of some network and its written articulation has to be necessarily sequential or at most as a tree the ability to reconstruct the original concept map in fact i will not be surprised in about 10 years time if every research paper is not required or mandated to be accompanied by a concept map so that people who can look at that concept map and then correlate different paragraphs of that research paper to each other so that they form a better model all right this is a very important part of communication the authors are trying to communicate something they convert this into this which you read and you try to create something in your mind how are you sure that that something is this same something that is how there are misconception that is how people interpret things differently because their model is all we have exhausted this class here but i would like to remind you that this lecture by the way does not talk about concept maps but this lecture talks about reading a paper let me just go through some sample thing you have to look a little hard to be able to locate it towards the end of the introduction or somewhere screen but what i want you to do is look at the colors i think you should be able to see at least that title i'm sure all of you found it's what's being shown in yellow abstract in fact here it says it's the abstract and it's usually the very first paragraph it's either there in different font or it's in go back and forth so you'll see that so she actually suggests that you circle the paragraph saying this is the point this paragraph is talking about please note that you are actually trying to write down the blobs of a concept map effective although she never mentions that because that time concept maps were not to the fore of our own understand okay <coughs> but you identify these important parts of that particular paper so this is the after getting the feel okay this is the next thing that you let me go directly to the section where she talks about timings the of oklahoma but you should also be able to find related work in the section on background on page 1 so basically she is talking about different components background details technical it is etc etc and you are supposed to identify them in the paper again not a very serious reading but this is important that you identify components of that paper saying this is what so the what paper so what this really tells us is that is that what you as the reader of the paper have so getting the big picture she has given a a sort of suggestion that what research area sub topic that is title to abstract what problem does the paper attempt to solve what the related work is what key contributions broadly how does the paper solve the problem these are the components of a research i like this breakup because this is exactly how you should be presenting a paper or a seminar report of your something very similar like who has to identify so it's exactly the should go through the section and sub section headings and then look at the figures diagrams illustrations and so on this is all you need to do at this pass in about what problem they are trying thing that was much new in terms of uh, this is where she suggests that you should never read a paper alone you should have a pair so although that topic may not be of interest to you but what that other person feels about it and what you feel about that so if you read in pair or a group small group it adds tremendous value to your own understanding but you have to discuss you don't just quietly sit in a class and listen to a lecture you are actually talking discussing and that is what is suggested was that the teacher had some you really want to get the big picture details paper that we've read so far write a two or three page review which contains a summary new solution presentation 
sense of the paper and to summarize it. For example, let's say you're writing a literature, a lot of papers that you will use for, and by well, you may not know what. If it, no, I miss it. Anyway, I'll close it because we are exceeding our time.